what at this point is going on. Is Porsche sandbagging? Quite possibly. Yes. Now, I've talked before about how amazing and legendary the Porsche 917 was. So I want to talk about its first race as a golf car, as the car we know now, the 917K, the short tail. Because Daytona back then was a whole other animal than it is today. And most people don't realize what a monster that track was. The 917 had been built over a few years as an all-dominant Group 5 sports car. And they were going to win Le Mans with it. And they were going to win Sebring. And they're going to win Daytona. And the plan was that they would go out to Daytona, test, and then go win there the first time out as the wear team, as the wear golf. And they rented the track in, I think, November and did like 26 hours of testing with their cars and nailed it. And they were like, we've got it. We've got this car dialed in. And the one addition they made, and you can tell a Daytona race car, or at least a 917, that in the banking, you can't see up here. You have to look up here to get through the curve, right? So they had to cut a hole in the roof and put another windshield in so they could see up and out of these cars. So they had the Daytona 917 ready. They had number one and number two. They had Porsche as support. They had John Weir's team from England. They had a, a Golf who was an American oil company, and they had an international team of drivers. They had Brian Redman from England, Joe Sifford from Switzerland, Pedro Rodriguez from Mexico, and Leo Kaninen from Finland. So this was like an amazing international effort. They also had the Porsche Salzburg team, the Austrian team. So there's another 917 on the field. There was another 917 privateer car that showed up that didn't make it out. But to give you an idea what Daytona was like, in 1970. These races aren't like they are today where it's extremely regulated and very specific cars. There were over 60 cars signed up to run this thing. The fields were enormous. I mean, lemon size fields. They had like over 60 cars signed up to run. And the cars were all over the shop as far as what they were. You had the three liter uh, prototypes and like the Ferrari 312 and the Porsche 908. And you had the big group five sports cars, which were gonna be the heroes of the race, which was the 917. And Ferrari finally showed up with their 512 V12s. And then you had Trans Am cars. You had the AMC Javelin, which I spoke about in the Chidi video from Penske. They were out there to test it, because why not? If you're gonna test a Trans Am car, why don't you run it for 24 hours? That car was out there. And even our good friend from the uh, 1965 Le Mans winning video, our good friend, the little 250 LM that won Le Mans, was there. They, that was its last hurrah as a race car in 1970. But at the bottom of the field, you had some real strange equipment. You had Austin Healey Sprites. You had Volvo Amazon 122s. You had all kinds of like cars that really you would never think about running with cars that are 220 mile an hour, you know, prototypes or this. And the best one of all of them was essentially, and it was in the prototype class, was a Volkswagen dune buggy. I mean, for better, for better words, it's exactly what it was. It was, an, it was a fiberglass open top dune buggy with a Volkswagen like 1700 CC engine in the back of it and it's sitting next to a 917. In fact, in practice, the test car, the T car, 917 T car, collided with the dune buggy while they were practicing, both getting a little damage. The, the dune buggy did not run the race. Um, it was owned by a guy who owned a Porsche dealer, and I think he pulled it just to <laughs> make things okay with Porsche. You have the 917s and the Ferrari 512s capable of well over 200 miles an hour. The top speed of the slowest cars, about 100 miles an hour. So closing speeds of over 100 miles an hour, which on a straightaway might be okay, but Daytona's not straight. Daytona was built 
and opened in 1959. And the technology that time allowed them to bank the corners at a maximum of 31 degrees. Now you can't stand on that. A car can't sit on that. It is insanely steep. And the idea was you could get insane speeds and stick with them without having to lift because the, the angle would turn the car. The big cars were expected to say high and the slow cars was expected to say low. Now, in the banking, if you look out your windshield, you're looking at the ground. If you look up, you can kind of see uh, about 100 feet in front of you. Now, let's make it nighttime. It's a 24-hour race. You've got 1970s headlights. And I'm not like LEDs, not projectors, not fan. These are old headlights. And they're pointed where? Into the ground. They're not pointed up there. And they're jiggling around anyway. And the taillights are like looking at a 1965 Volkswagen Bug taillight, like a little seven watt bulb. And you're closing at 100 miles an hour through these corners, jiggling around, and it's hot. Like it's 100 and something degrees in the cockpit of a 917. And the only suspension in the corners, because you're being compressed into it, centrifugal force is pushing you into those corners. The only suspension you have is cartilage and your cerebral spinal fluid in your spine because the tires and suspension are flat against that thing. And you're just, and your eyeballs are jiggling and you're trying to see if an Austin, if an Austin Healey is you're coming up on it, you're gonna crash into it. If you look at pictures of the 917 that won, there are tire marks up the side of the car where it made contact, where little cars would come up and tap them. Now 917, at that time weighed about just under 1,800 pounds. And it's moving at those kind of speeds. And you had Mustangs and Camaros, which weighed twice as much coming up on the inside, right? The bravery it took to drive in these conditions. And also remember, back then, there were no lights of the 24 hours of daytime. There were no big lights shining down. It, it, it's like daytime there now, it's a carnival. And literally, there's a carnival going on at Daytona. Back then, it was dark. You had your headlights, you had taillights, and you had a prayer. And you set off into the night, and the maximum stint back then was four hours. You had two drivers, you could drive up to four hours in those conditions. Now that you got an idea of what that felt like, you can imagine what the race was like. So the pole position was won by the Ferrari 512. Now the 512 at this point, they brought five of them, hadn't been tested. Like the 512 was almost a year, 10 months behind the development of the 917. Ferrari got caught with their pants down because Porsche picked up on a hole in the rules for the group five cars to make a sports car. And they built the 917 in 10 months. A 12 cylinder, a flat 12 cylinder, race car from scratch. And Ferrari in 69 was like, oh crap. So out come the new 512s, paid for because Ferrari had sold in 69 their road division to Fiat. So they had more money to go racing. So let's build, let's go up against these 917s. And Andretti puts it on pole, which everybody was kind of like, how did that happen? The Ferrari is heavier and it's got less power. And people are a little confused. Like, what at this point is going on? Is Porsche sandbagging? Quite possibly, yes. So the race starts, Andretti takes off, and the one and two cars of Porsche are behind. And it takes all of a few seconds, and the Porsches just go, and they're gone. Like, thanks for that, because, Pole position is nothing in a 24 hour race. Who cares? You're gonna take 24 hours to make up that space. Not a problem. Now the drivers had different ways of driving. Uh, Joe Siffert was famous as the hard charger. He was the guy, he was the rabbit. You put him out there and he just tore things up. And Rodriguez was very calculating and he'd figure everything out. You know, Redmond was about as solid a driver as you can get. So was Kunin, and he was kind of a little unknown. He came from, from Rally, but he was super solid as well. But the main two drivers of each car were Siffert and Rodriguez. And they blaze off into the distance. Now, over 24 hours, all kinds of weird things happen, as we learned in the Lamar video. 
the number one car is going to be your lead car. Number two car was going to be the two car. And then we have five Ferraris. And there was the other 917 in the Salzburg car. Salzburg car didn't survive. And most of the 512s fell into issue. They, Daytona is brutal on cars. You can imagine, like I was talking about in the banking, slamming into the banking, all the G-forces. Finally, the shock towers just let go. And they patched those cars together. I mean, it is duct tape and, you know, self-tapping screws and aluminum sheet and what we gotta do, strap it together, keep going. And the 917s take off. The one car eventually has an issue and its clutch goes. They're like, they're waiting for Brian Redman. They're like, there's Redman. Like, everything's on schedule. The laps are less than two minutes long and he's not there. And then he comes in on the curtain and pulls in. The clutch is gone. Which, if you had ever seen the way a 917 engine sits inside its chassis, it is like a little cradle, and that massive engine just fits right inside. And I've seen them be pulled in and out at the shop at Canapa, and it is a procedure. And so, where's like, well, you know, that car's done. And they start pushing it back towards the trucks. And the Porsche mechanics are like, nine, we can fix this. And they're like, nobody told us you could fix these. Like. Everything that's been told to everybody is that you can't do a quick clutch swap on a 917. They're like, we can do it in an hour and 15 minutes. Very specific, because they're German. Hour and 15 minutes. And that would kind of keep them in the running, because they had already moved away quite well from the Ferraris. The Porsche mechanics are like, bring it back here. They bring it in, and they fix it in 50 minutes. Just to mm, stick it to them, right? Off goes the number one car. Now this fallen way behind the number two car. And in the interim, Brian Redman, who is the driver from that, it's quite traditional sometimes to move the lead drivers into another car. And so they moved Redman into the number two car and he's up there and there's no radio communication going on like we have today. He's just driving and <laughs> Siffert comes blowing by him in the number one car. And he's like, someone's driving by my car. <laughs> So he comes in to pit, and they, they swap him out, and he gets back in, he starts rotating with Siffert. And it is really complicated. There's, there's no transponders like we have today. I mean, even basic racing has transponders to tell you how many laps you've done. Back then, it was you, it was a clipboard, you'd hand off to somebody else and a stopwatch, and you would keep track of your car and the cars around it and see where people were. And they lost track of what was going on. Now. All the cars had issues. A lot of them had headlight issues. The headlights were, were literally ripping off. The Ferrari, Andretti's Ferrari had been called in because the headlights, one headlight was out, they called him in. Taillight went out, got black flagged, they bring it in. Like, stuff was just shaking loose. And the, and the Porsches had the same issue. But the engines were running like a top. And it was obvious how prepared where it was. When daylight comes, the number two car is way out front and they're not quite sure what's going on between the Ferrari. They think they're in third place. So as the final hour, the half hour comes in, they think they're in second place and they give Siffert the signal to go. Like, we think you can catch him? So in the final half hour, Joe Siffert, like this the man could drive, just starts crushing it. And I mean, he not only beats Andretti's qualifying time, he crushes the qualifying time by like five seconds. And he's burning off lap after lap. Turns out he was already in second place. It was completely unnecessary. Little slip of the pencil, sorry about that. The end result was that the number two Porsche 917 won ahead of the second place car by 45 laps the greatest victory ever at Daytona. Still to this day, no one's ever won by 45 laps. The second place car was three laps ahead of the Ferrari, the remaining Ferrari, the Andretti Ferrari. It was such a mic drop. It was just like, mm, we're here. This is the greatest race car ever. And it was. Daytona just was the launch pad for what the 917 would accomplish over the next two years. It would win Le Mans that year. It would be the first victory for Porsche at Le Mans. 
they would win the world championship that year. In 71, they would win the world championship again. They would win Daytona again. They would win Sebring and it would win Le Mans. And then it was over. It was relegated out of existence because that's what you do to great cars. You don't want to see them exist forever. Got to give Ferrari a chance. I mean, the FAA made a very smart decision and moved uh, competition along. But those years, those two years, the 917 was the ultimate race car. And I love Le Mans, but I think Daytona was the ultimate race. We'd like to thank Glossit for supporting the VinWiki channel this month. And right now, Glossit is offering the best DIY ceramic coating package that we've ever seen or certainly offered here on VinWiki. For just $69.99, you're going to get their graphene ceramic coating along with the Real Difference Maker, their ceramic detail spray. Now, that's a $50 bottle of spray detailer that I truly love just for daily use. But when you use that alongside their graphene ceramic coating, it makes the removal a lot easier, the outcome a lot smoother, you avoid high spots and things like that. So a DIY idiot like me in my own garage can achieve an outcome pretty similar to what Rich and his team were able to do last year on the Paris Hilton SLR, which I eventually torture tested on rallies and road trips and all this stuff. And it is now in Bulgaria still looking wonderful. So check it out now at the link in the description below. There's a very limited quantity, so respond now and get yours for just $69.99. Thanks, Glosset.